But the one who had received one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. The easy part of this particular parable would be simply to focus on the first two. For they receive these vast amounts of money and they are diligent with it. They go and they double what the master has given them. The master is delighted by the work they have done. And so he invites them to say, well done, good and trustworthy slave, and invites them to enter his joy. I'm not exactly sure what the joy is that we are being called to enter into, but it sounds pretty good either way. But it is the third slave that just disturbs us. How do we reconcile a God who's blessed us abundantly, yet seems so harsh with this chap who didn't do anything with the talent he was given? David Luce, commenting on this particular parable, says this. There are two ways to read this parable. You see, while I'm familiar with the dominant one, that our waiting for the master's return should be purposeful and not idle, I was struck this time by the reaction of the third slave. And not just his reaction, but also his motivation. He is, as he himself confesses, is terrified of his master. He's terrified of his master. He believes his master to be harsh, aggressive in his dealings, if not even exploitative. David Luce goes on to say, we have no evidence at this point in the parable that the master is in fact this way. But the servant believes it and is subsequently afraid. And so he freezes. Fear will do that. And as a result of his fear, he does not do anything with the money that has been given and entrusted to him. He's terrified that if he risks it in the marketplace, he may lose it and reap terrible consequences when his master returns. Little does he know, by doing nothing, he reaped the same consequences. The third slave is simply afraid. A little bit like me laying in bed that particular night, scared to turn left or to turn right. So we lay still, incapacitated to do anything, hoping simply that we will survive. He seems, it deems it better to preserve his own safety and security than to run the risk of losing the money and angering his master. So the question comes to us, how do we see God? Who is God for us? You see, the answer to that question will tell us how we will live our lives. You see, if we fear God, afraid of judgment and damnation, scared to turn left or to turn right, we will do nothing. But if we understand that God encourages us in life's journey to take the responsibility, to take the risk, 
and to do something even if it is a small something in being obedient to his word. We will not live our lives afraid and incapacitated, but we'll be encouraged to try as it may to do something, anything, Jill Duffield, also commenting on this text, says, Fear engenders scarcity and self-protection, not generosity and creativity. Fear makes us clamp down and look inwardly. It forces us to bury ourselves in the ground, Tempting self preservation. But let's take a moment and talk about the perceived judgment of the Master in this parable. Because it stands that the third sa- slave had every reason to be afraid that the Master was harsh. Matt Skinner says this the parable works only when we accept its main premise, that the stakes are sky high and our involvement is essential. You would be upset too if you discovered that an influential person was refusing to make a difference amidst a crisis, wouldn't you? If there was somebody who simply said, I'm afraid to get involved, but I could make a difference. So the master is upset that the servant had potential to do something good and didn't. Instead, he buried his potential and therefore the world and consequently other people were perhaps poorer because of it. Friends, for us today, the stakes are sky high. And yes, we have been implored to participate in the healing of the world. Not in order to be granted salvation, because that is simply granted to us by faith alone. But rather, Jesus' call for us to be the light of the world, to do good where there is evil, to bring hope where there's disillusionment and cynicism, and to love and care for all those whom the Lord loves. Friends, we have to make a choice about how we're going to live our lives. Because if we choose to live it in fear, whether it's of God or fear of ourselves, fear will incapacitate us and force us to bury ourselves in the opportunities that are before us. But if we choose to step out in faith and to risk it all, to bring light to the world, we will be invited into the joy of the Master. Finally, I end with these words. As Gandalf says in The Hobbit, I have found that it is the small everyday deeds of ordinary folk that keeps the darkness at bay. It is our small acts of kindness that double in portion. And how wonderful is that? Thanks be to God. Amen.